good afternoon. Welcome to TNC Radio. Live. This is the Truckers Network Radio Show. And now here's your host, Shelly Johnson. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. Yes, this is the Truckers Network Radio Show on TNC Radio. Live, where we offer the news, information, traffic, weather, sports, and entertainment our commercial drivers want and need. The economy is a topic that has everyone concerned today. Owner operators and company drivers alike are seeing constant fluctuations in fuel and food pricing that some people say signal hyperinflationary conditions. What is really going on and how does that impact us? Are we in for another problem worse than 08? We decided to consult an expert. Rick Roberts is a professor of economics at Monmouth University. He's also a former 20 year executive at the Federal Reserve. Rick is considered one of the top experts who can give people straight talk about the economy and investing and is spot on with his insights and predictions. Rick is with us today on the show and we're excited. Welcome, Rick. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Shelley. Thanks for having me. Before we begin, I thought I'd let you tell everybody a little bit about your background and what's made you an economic guru. Well, you know, I grew up in Philadelphia in a uh, actually in a fairly impoverished environment, uh, grew up in, on welfare and so forth. I was the uh, uh, um, kind of lucky to get out of that and um, ended up studying economics at uh, Penn State and uh, went on from there and uh, became more interested in it, became an economist with the Federal Reserve, spent uh Oh, geez, 10, 15 years in Kansas City working at the Federal Reserve. Uh, jumped down to Dallas for a short period into St. Louis uh, at the Federal Reserve and then back to New York uh, for the last oh, roughly 10 years of my career. While in New York, uh, I headed up the Federal Reserve's credit risk management response to the 08 financial crisis. So I've, I've kind of been around and uh, I've seen a number of these economic situations before. So when you were doing that, did you say, gee, uh, I didn't learn this in college? <laughs> Was this a, a total surprise? How would you handle something like that? Sure. You know, it's like anything. Um, you know, you can learn in a book to your blue in the face, but until you're out there, and ex- I'm sure your listeners know this, right? You can study and read, and but until you're out there dealing with these uh, you know, real world situations. It's not quite what you learned in your book or in the classroom, et cetera. So most of my learning has come, frankly, from real world experience, a little bit less so from the, you know, fancy education and all the time I sat, uh, you know, reading books and doing assignments and so forth. Mm-hmm. Probably useful, but most of my learning came from being out there in the field. And that's so important. You know, it seems to me we've had a tumultuous couple of decades with the dot-com bomb, the fallout from 9-11, the Great Recession, the pandemic, and whatever's going on now. I know people are braced and, frankly, a bit scared. What's going on today? I've heard things like hyperinflation, stagflation, recession, and even an impending depression. You know, all those things are on people's minds. And it's a great question you asked, Shelley. Um, uh, of course, we fell into the COVID pandemic, right? That landed on our doorsteps. And for better or worse, in hindsight, I think most would agree it's worse. We, we decided to shut down most aspects of the economy and, uh, and then tried to restart it. And that in and of itself, without any additional COVID coming or any of these other problems, that's a major task. It's never been done before. And I, when I was out uh, giving speeches, uh, you know, in April of, or May of 2020, um, I said, watch out because this is going to be awful tricky to pull this thing off. And of course we, we ended up starting the economy back up and then other problems have come along, but in an attempt to, help the economy get back on its feet, the folks in America who have a good impact on the economy, both those in Congress, the president, as well as the Federal Reserve, um, did things to try to help the economy out after we shut it down, to try to get it back on its feet. And indeed, 
Oh, go ahead. Do you have a question? No, no. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, and indeed, um, they uh, d took actions to get the economy back on its feet, and it grew very rapidly there for a while. But in hindsight, they did too much. The government spent too much money. They often have that problem, but they really overdid it this time with the COVID checks. You know, not saying some some folks didn't need that money, but um, you know, when you're in a crisis, and I've been there before in the room, um, you often you don't have time to think through the details of how your response is going to work. You know, you don't, you don't have the time because you, you continue to sink. The economy potentially continued to sink. So Congress decided to send out money. Many folks got money that probably didn't need it or indeed didn't need it. And that's led to a lot of buying power with individuals. Savings of Americans were at record highs earlier this year, record highs history since statistics have been kept <clears throat> so that was one piece the government spent a lot of money gave americans a lot of money to spend to keep us out of a, a strong recession maybe a depression as you say shelly mm -hmm. uh, and um you know it worked but it was too much and then but then on top of that we have this second group of people that you know try to impact the economy and these, these groups don't work together. They kind of do their own thing, if you will. And the second group is where I spent 20 some years, uh, and that's the Federal Reserve. You, you, you've heard of them, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, they saw the same problem where, you know, COVID's here. We shut down the economy. We get, we're worried, you know, the economy may fall into a deep recession or worse. What are we going to do? And the Federal Reserve has a couple options. Uh, mainly, they operate through changing interest rates. So the Federal Reserve lowered interest rates, and you know, no, not by no surprise, lower interest rates encourages people to spend more money to take out that loan that they might otherwise not have taken because the payments lower now because rates went down. Right. Get that mortgage, get that car, um, run up your credit cards, possibly. Uh, well, it's a little less interest rate sensitive, but. Um, so we had, you know, the Fed did this at the same time that the government, our good friends in Washington, D.C., spent a lot of money. So we had these two efforts at the same time encouraging U.S. consumers, the you and I, the buyers of goods and services in the U.S., encouraging us to spend money because that's going to help the economy, right? We buy things. Companies have to hire more people and so forth, income goes up, and uh, they just overdid it. There's so much money in the economy now that uh, inflation, as, as you pointed to earlier, is at uh, record highs. Uh, you know, we have, I haven't seen this in my career over 40 years, wow. inflation at, the, at this high a pace. And it's um, all due primarily to, uh, or importantly is due, regardless of what the experts tell you, and we can talk about supply issues in a second here, but a lot of this inflation, the big, biggest part of it, in my judgment, is due to errors made by those two groups of folks that I mentioned about earlier. Too much spending by Congress and mm -hmm. too low interest rates for too long by the Federal Reserve. You'd think that they'd get together and get their heads together when they're facing a crisis so that uh, it goes smoothly and doesn't end up causing a bigger problem. You know, I tell my classes here, as it's a great time to take an economics class. You know, this is really, and your listeners would appreciate it, if, especially if you went through 08. You knew that was, and Shelly, we were talking before we went on here, but, we, you know, we knew that was a historic time, right, 08? Yeah. Crisis. Right now is another one of those. We're in the middle of it right now, so many people may not sense that. But I can tell you, I've been through all those crises that you mentioned earlier, and this is another one that's going to be written about for a long time. We probably won't see another one like this in our lifetime, certainly in mine. And um, but I tell my students, um, this will certainly be an outcome, I hope, of this crisis when we get through it. And let's get through it. It may be a, a year, maybe longer. Who knows? Um, but uh, we, we have to do a better job of 
those two groups that I mentioned, Congress, right, mm-hmm. and the Federal Reserve, the second group, they must do uh, a better job of talking with each other. There's some laws in place as it, as it relates to the creation and, and uh, functioning of the Federal Reserve that limits what the Fed can do in terms of talking with Congress. It's supposed to be a, a, an independent agency that does its own thing, but sure. that may work in many, t- many situations, but unfortunately it doesn't work in a crisis, certainly not the crisis that we had and still are in that's COVID related. Yeah. Uh, communication seems like it's an essential component, especially when you're heading in uncharted territory. Uh, so that you don't have a bigger problem. Because if you're throwing water on a fire that needs maybe to be starved of oxygen, (laughs) that's never going to work. It's going to make it worse. So That's a good analogy. Well, thank you, Rick. Uh, We do have to go to break here. We're talking with Rick Roberts. He spent 20 years at the Federal Reserve, and he's currently a professor at Monmouth University. He's an expert on economics, and I can't wait to ask more questions. You're listening to the Truckers Network radio show here on TNC Radio. Dot live. Stay tuned for more coming up. This blog on TNC Radio. Live is brought to you by the Truckers Network at app.thetruckersnetwork.net. Six safety tips for truck driving in hot weather. Driving in the heat can create dangerous situations for truck drivers. Drivers need to take specific precautions before hitting the road in extreme heat. With the incoming heat wave dubbed as a heat dome by the National Weather Service, Drivers need to be aware of how to safely drive in these weather conditions. Follow our six safety tips for truck driving in hot weather. Every truck driver needs to complete a pre-trip inspection before driving, especially in hot weather. Check tires. Heat can have a huge effect on your tires. As the temperature increases, so does the air pressure in your tires. During the hottest months of the year, it's important to frequently check your tire pressure. Frequently checking on your tires can save you from a blowout. To get an accurate measurement, wait for your tires to cool down before checking the pressure. The heat and friction from the road cause your tires to warm up, which will cause a rise in tire pressure. Also, don't be afraid to take a break every couple of hours to let your tires cool down. While traveling in the summer months, you may want to give yourself some extra time to stop and check on your tires. Protect your engine. Not only should you protect yourself from the heat this summer, but you should also protect your engine. One way to keep your engine from overheating is to frequently check the engine oil. The oil keeps the engine cool and keeps the parts running smoothly. Engine coolant is just as important as engine oil. Coolant helps prevent the engine from overheating in extremely hot temperatures. Keep an eye on the coolant temperature gauge while driving. If the gauge goes above the safe temperature, pull over and see what's going on. Failing to assess the situation could lead to engine failure. Also make sure to check for leaks in the hoses. A cracked hose could lead to engine failure. Tips to protect yourself from hot weather. It's just as important to protect yourself during extremely hot weather. Follow these steps to keep yourself cool and safe during these hot months. Stock up on water. As the temperature increases, you need to increase your water intake. Make sure to always have water in your truck. You never know when you might get stuck in traffic or break down on the side of the road. Wear sunscreen. Many truck drivers forget this step. Even when you're in your truck, you're still exposed to the harmful UVA rays from the sun. Make sure to put sunscreen on before hitting the road. Wear light-colored clothes. Light-colored clothing reflects light, and dark-colored clothing absorbs it. Wearing light-colored, loose-fitting clothes helps you stay cooler and more comfortable on the road. And be sure to check out our blog, Six Safety Tips for Truck Driving While Driving in the Rain. This blog on TNCRadio.live was brought to you by the Truckers Network at app.thetruckersnetwork.net. I'm Ron Samuels. We put it in reverse gear so you can enjoy the history of popular music and hear the soundtrack of life Wednesdays at 8 Eastern and 7 Central, right after the train station on TNC Radio.live. 
Welcome back to the Truckers Network Radio Show on TNC Radio Live. I'm Shelley Johnson with Tom Kelly. And we're talking with an economic expert. Rick Roberts spent 20 years at the Federal Reserve, and he's currently a professor at Monmouth University. He's a wealth of information. Rick, in our previous segment, you mentioned the supply chain. What is happening with that right now, and what role is that playing in our current economic uncertainty? Right. So in terms of the economic uncertainty, you point to, Shelley, in segment one, we were talking about, well, part of it is due to... um, unfortunate actions that two po- groups of policymakers or people took, right? Congress and then the Federal Reserve. So that led to uh, buyers, consumers, if you will, having a lot of money in their hands to buy things. And they, they gave them too much, all right? So that that's led to uh, inflation problems. Now, on top of that, beca- and re- also related to it, because so much money was given to consumers, to you and I, to buy things or demand increased so sharply that suppliers could not keep up producing the amount of goods that consumers, you and I, that formerly were locked down for a period, some or totally, uh, demanded or wanted. So um, supply chain slowed down the production of goods and in economics, Um, And probably common sense will tell you that when there's fewer goods available, the price of those goods goes up. You know, if uh, you want to buy a a, uh, new car, you have your heart set on it, but uh, you go to the car lot and they say, you know, I'm having a hard time getting that car. The price of that car is going to be higher than it otherwise would be if the dealer had, you know, a couple hundred similar cars to the one you want on his or her lot. So, so so that's one problem is that the demand was up so high. This is from the supply side. The demand was up so high that suppliers or producers, if you will. And when we say supply side, supply chain, as you, as you know, Mm -hmm. your audience knows, we're talking about the producers of goods relating to them and where do they get their inputs from as well. And, um, so there was a lot for them to produce. They couldn't do it fast enough. That forced up prices. And then because on a second issue with producers that relates to uh, COVID is that because of the pandemic, um, producers had many producers, and this is worldwide, right? Importantly, China, you know how that impacts everything, mm-hmm. um, had COVID-related issues that just slowed down their production, Right. They couldn't get the people to work or they couldn't get the resources in, et cetera. So we had suppliers of inputs to companies that made goods kind of a bottle had a bottleneck so that companies uh, had to slow down their production because of that. So we they, companies faced um, high demand from you and I for goods and also problems producing goods because of supply chain issues that fed into their production. So the old, um, you know, computer chips that we've heard about, uh, an important part of most automobiles, um, um, limited because of supply chain issues. And that that's limited the uh, supply of new automobiles and has put the price tag of autos way up as a result. So the big picture is we've had problems both on the, uh, from the um, um, government, Congress spending too much money, the Federal Reserve holding rates too low, too long, pumping too much money into the economy. And then um, these other supply chain issues that are partly related to the high demand that was caused by those two groups that we talked about earlier. And then also the supply chain issues just due to the COVID outbreak and how that impacted the providers of resources to, to companies that make goods and services. Yeah, it, it seems like a perfect storm for a very unsavory outcome. Tom, Absolutely. Yeah. Tom, you said you had a question. Yeah, Rick. Um, well, first, I should start off by saying, I'm a smaller government person. I, I don't usually uh, want to add things to the government, but I I, I see a a, um, a missed lessons learned here in that one of the things we can't, that came out in nine eleven was we we weren't talking to each other well, right? And so we formed the Homeland Security. 
uh, to, to look at our national defense. Now, we can argue about whether or not that's been successful, but you know, that, that was an outcrop of, of what came there. One of the things that, you know, and you've mentioned this, uh, n- not everybody talking to each other well since, uh, since all the COVID stuff, one of the big concerns I had, and again, not getting into whether or not vaccines were necessary, masks, or people staying at home, but we had the CDC making decisions that directly impacted the economy without any kind of checks and balance there. I'm wondering if we need something the equivalent of Homeland Security, because I don't think they should take this on, but something that looks at at what are the decisions that are being made that impact the economy overall and quit doing this stovepipe stuff? Am I onto something or is that just... I'd agree with that. I mean, I too happen to be on the side of the spectrum more for a smaller government than bigger. But in crises that have so many facets like this one and 08, and we're certain to see another one, although, like I said, I don't think we'll see another one this big in our in my lifetime, but who knows? Um, there's so many pieces of the pie that are impacted, so many areas that are impacted that instead of having, you know, different groups making decisions that impact others without having an understanding of what, you know, what that impact might be, it's high time, and, and possibly this is getting at your question, the spirit of your question is to, you know, ensure that we have next time a, you know, a cross-functional or a, you know, a, a some sort of a group that includes representatives from all areas of the nation that are impacted, right? right. And this is, this would include truckers and and uh, other, you know, just critical pieces of our economy, as well as you know the big picture economists who think they understand from the textbook perspective. But you need some really, as with most topics in economics, you need to talk to the frontline people to kind of get an understanding. Hey, if we do this, what do you think that and um, as well as you're right, you had CDC weighing in on issues that impacted the economy in hindsight, actually in real time, I thought that was not a great idea. No. But again, I hesitate from criticizing too much because when you're in the middle, when you're in the battlefield making decisions here and everybody's, th- you know, all these issues are coming at you. You try to do your best. I think they tried to do their best. It just wasn't very good. Well, and, and I don't think they, again, we, we're, we missed the thread of if we if we pull on this, that's going to create this issue over here. Uh, and, you know, there are a lot of people in the trucking industry who've been saying for over a year, watch out, here comes major inflation. And they could see it early on just by how much they were able to get in moving, uh, their, uh, moving stuff around the country. You know, that when somebody's going to pay for that in the end, you know, it's not, you know, yeah. it's, you know, it's uh, it becomes very expensive to move goods. Well, in the end, who's going to pay for that? They're not going to just give that away for free. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, the folks are there, you know, I'm certain they're willing to provide input <clears throat> on, on, uh, you know, different options in terms of what we can do from a policy perspective to address a problem. But, you know, sometimes, and I thought this was at the Fed as well, frankly, and to some extent, I'm criticizing myself. Uh, I have to be probably more of a blue collar person than a, uh, you know, an Ivy Leaguer. But, you know, a lot of these groups, the two groups that I mentioned, and we talked about, right, Congress, Fed, and then these other issues, supply chain issues. Uh, those first two groups are largely, you know, uh, white collar, wealthy folks that, you know, haven't, in some cases, haven't a clue in terms of what the real world is all about. You know, they may have passed through it at one point in their careers, but it's been a long time. If they did, and many didn't, born with a silver spoon, if you will, but um, many didn't and, uh, um, you know, really lack this understanding of, you know, reach of of the uh, frontline worker or anybody on the front line is impacted by some of the policies that they pass. They understand it for like from a textbook perspective, right? But like we said earlier about, I think Shelley asked, where'd you get all your learning? I mm-hmm. said very little of it was was in the textbook. It's out there in the real world. And I think many of the and policies- And that's what counts. 
Yeah, it does. It does. And many of the policymakers kind of lack that. They, you know, they either didn't come from the real world, so to speak, if you know what I'm saying, or it's been a while since they've been there. And I think there's really a need to reach out to the real world. In economics, we call these, you know, real world folks, Main Street, if you will. Economics mm-hmm. divides people up conveniently into Wall Street and Main Street. Right. And uh, we need more Main Street in our policies for sure. I've always felt that the politicians should do a regular in service where they're actually um, mixing with the public and, and living like they do so that they can really see what what they do and how it impacts. Um, mm-hmm. I know that's not never going to happen, but <laughs> yeah, that, very good. <laughs> there's an exception at the at the Federal Reserve. There's a uh, you know they this is public information in terms of their net worth and so forth. The the uh, Board of Governors of the Fed mm-hmm. and they're multi millionaires for sure. Um, but with a couple exceptions, one is uh, a woman who is the president of the Kansas City Fed, Miss Esther George who is, you know, probably the, in my judgment, the most talented person on the Fed. Uh, And she doesn't have a PhD, but she has real world understanding. She's homegrown from the, from the heartland. She grew up in, uh, I believe, Fawcett, Missouri. You ever heard heard of that city? Small city, a small town, just North, North Kansas city, North Kansas city. Um, Have you heard of it, Tom? Yes, I have, but I grew up, I grew up near there, so that's okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's why. So, I so we have we have a critical the the Fed uh, elitism, if you will, but there are some exceptions, and uh, you know most noteworthy is uh, Esther George, who is on the Federal Reserve's Board of Governors. She'll be voting tomorrow on interest rates as a result, but uh, she she is a uh, I'd say a, the the uh, the uh, individual at the Fed who stands up for blue collar Main Street America. Mm-hmm. And that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. There's some uh, so much more I want to unpack here, but we do have to go to break. We're talking with Rick Roberts. He spent 20 years at the Federal Reserve. He's currently a professor at Monmouth University, and he's got some great perspectives and insight on the economy, on investing, the whole thing. Stay tuned right here on the Truckers Network Radio Show on TNC Radio Live. Being on the road can make you feel free, excited, and adventurous. It can also make you feel lonely and even depressed. So it's important for truckers, especially long-haul truck drivers, to bring items on the road to keep them entertained. Truckers have 10 hours off for a 24-hour day. Depending on how long the driver sleeps, there can be several hours where the trucker has nothing to do. We've broken down the list of essential items to keep in your truck in several different categories. The second category we talk about is entertainment. Laptop or tablet. Bring a laptop or tablet and stream your favorite movies or TV shows. If you don't have access to Wi-Fi or a personal hotspot, you can still bring your laptop, some DVDs, and watch a movie. Game console. Playing games is a great way to keep yourself entertained. You can also play with your friends. Bring your Xbox or PlayStation and set up your own gaming station in the cab of your truck. Puzzles, crosswords, or cards. If gaming or watching movies don't interest you, bring some puzzles or crosswords to solve. You can also get a deck of cards and play games like Solitaire, March Same Rank, Devil's Grip, Klondike. Books. Reading books is a great way to pass time and improve brain connectivity. Some popular trucker books include The Highway by C.J. Box, Blue Highways by William Least Heat Moon, Paradise Valley by C.J. Box, Rough Way to the Highway by Kelly Mac McCoy, Exercise equipment. Truck driver's health suffers from the lack of exercise. Bringing exercise equipment on the road will keep you entertained and improve your overall well-being. There are several portable exercise equipment items you can store in the cab of your truck. They include dumbbells, resistance bands, kettlebells, and running shoes. Hello, everybody. This is Todd Dewey from the hit show Ice Road Truckers on the History Channel. And my source of radio and all truckers news, I go to tncradio.live. Welcome back to the Truckers Network radio show on tncradio.live. I'm Shelley Johnson with Tom Kelly. 
And we're talking with Rick Roberts, who spent 20 years at the Federal Reserve. He's currently a professor at Monmouth University. Rick, you've got some terrific insight. And I know there are a lot more questions we could be asking, but... I think a lot of people are really nervous about the stock market, and that's really what's in the news right now. It looks like it's a bear market. What's going on there? Well, th- this uh, a couple of things in terms of what the volatility we've seen lately. And boy, yesterday was a nasty day, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, oh it was boy. Friday. Yeah, Friday and Monday. Bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, the market is anticipating the Federal Reserve's meeting tomorrow. Actually, it's a two-day meeting today and tomorrow, but they will announce tomorrow whether or not they will raise interest rates further, which they will, certainly, I believe, and how much they'll raise them by. So uh, we've had some horrendous inflation numbers out, wholesale prices most recently that are at record high, continue to be at record highs when many economists said we, you, they, many ex- economists had expected a downturn in, in prices, kind of a leveling off of inflation and maybe some sense of a start of a return to normalcy, but that we didn't see that. So uh, this most folks in the stock market, bond market now expect the Fed having seen those terrible inflation numbers to raise interest rates. Remember, they lowered interest rates to get the economy moving. They happened to get it moving too good, and that's led to some pretty steep inflation here. So in order to kind of reverse what they did, um, they will raise interest rates to try to slow down the economy. And uh, higher interest rates are not good for Firms generally, kind of common sense, right? More expensive to buy, more expensive to expand your plant and so forth. And uh, this is likely to cause a economic slowdown or worse. So the stock market is fearing now a, a substantial economic slowdown. Always during these periods of volatility as you have the You know, the folks out there yelling depression around the corner, you know, the the real negative folks. I don't see that right now, Mm -hmm. although it's easy to get caught up in that. It just takes one big name individual to say it. And then you have quite a following. Everyone's on board. But I don't see that right now. You know, a sharp recession uh, near term anyway. But the Fed certainly will be raising interest rates. And uh, that'll happen tomorrow. They'll bump up interest rates again. It's got the market concerned. Um, You know, how far will the Fed go beyond tomorrow with higher interest rates? And what's that mean for the companies who issue stocks? Is this going to damage things? Uh, I I would think that there'd be a point of no return where uh, you've raised it too much and things contract way too much. I mean, it's certainly going to have a negative impact on real estate, which is really overheated in terms of pricing. And in terms of other prices, we've got fuel prices, which are just going up like crazy. Uh, So that's just going to increase the price of goods. How is this all going to work out? So it's a Great question, and it may not work out well. You know, we may see a, and the outcome of not working out well is a deep recession. Mm -hmm. I don't see that. I have some confidence that the Fed can do a reasonable job at this, but that's still going to lead to a substantial economic slowdown, possibly a mild recession in 2023. Um, But, uh, you know, the Fed has caused inflation. The only thing the Fed can do to try to get rid of inflation is to cause folks to spend less money. And the way they're gonna do that is to raise interest rates. Um, Additionally, um, raising interest rates, as we talked earlier to your good question, Shelley, about the stock market, raising interest rates tends to lower the value of stocks. And that that lowers the wealth that you and I or anyone else who owns stock has. So because the wealth goes down, we're spending less money as well. So the Fed is probably quite pleased to see the stock market going down because that means 
owners of stock will have less money to spend. And what the Fed's trying to do is get consumers to spend less, to take pressure off the uh, inflation rate. But the flip side of that is it's a trade-off. They're going to spend less, but then they're buying less goods and firms hire less people to make those goods. And then we've got an economic downturn. So it's this balancing act between employment or the economy growth and the rate of inflation. And the Fed has the inflation rate way up with the assistance of Congress, by the way, and some supply chain issues that we talked Mm -hmm. about before. And uh, the Fed is doing its part to pull down, try to get inflation down by raising interest rates. Of course, we have those other parties, right? Let's put that supply chain top piece of the inflation story out there and say, we can't do a whole lot about that. These are kind of one-off situations, the war in Ukraine, OPEC, oil production. Mm -hmm. Uh, Biden's already done his, you know, routine, if you will, to the oil industry here. You know, if we, if we reverse that, it's going to take some time. So these, those things, let's just set aside and say, they'll work themselves out to the extent that they can. It's going to take a while, but then we have the other player, which is Congress, the fed lowered rates and now they can reverse it by raising rates. Congress gave a lot of money out, spent a lot of money. They can't reverse that by saying, Hey, give me my money back. Give me those unemployment benefits back or those COVID checks back. But they, what they can do, and I'm keeping an eye on president Biden with this because he seems not to quite get it yet. They can do is stop spending, stop excessive spending, particularly types of spending that's going to put additional demand by you and I to buy more goods because that's caused the problem. We want to stop that for now. Um, so I'm keeping an eye on Biden and the, and the, and Congress in conjunction with Congress to ensure that they don't continue to spend. That's not what we need now. They can just stop. That'll be their part. The fed will raise interest rates. That'll be their part. And hopefully the supply chain stuff will more or less work itself out, but it's going to take a while to do so. Sure. And I think that there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, I, I think people have a sense that nobody really know, knows what's going on, that everybody at, at the federal level are throwing mud on the wall, hoping something's going to stick. And in the meantime, you've got fuel prices that are going up all over the place and uncertainty in terms of electric and natural gas, because that's going up and people are hearing that they're going to have rolling blackouts. I think it's just creating a lot of tension. It is. It is. And to the extent that, you know, unlike, you know, the three of us who have been through a few crises, there's a number of people that really haven't been through an 08 or, you know, were paying much attention to it when it was here. Mm -hmm. And this is all new stuff to them. And, you know, the stress is higher than it might be if you've been through this a number of times. Not that the stress would be absent if you went through it before. It's always there, right? Your Mm -hmm. family, your bills, how are you going to fill your your, uh, gas tank and so forth? Yeah. Right out loud, I just paid, you know, $100 to fill my gas tank. It just crazy. And I'm, you know, I'm even, I'm thinking about uh, making some changes to, you know, uh, use my automobile less, frankly, but uh, yeah, a lot of, a lot of stress out there for a lot of people. Well, it's getting to the point if the fuel costs keep going up, people won't be able to afford to go to work if they're 30 miles out or more, that that's a pricey trip twice a day. And that adds to this whole, that's a whole circular effect and they're not going to work. And then that's slowing down the economy even further. And yeah. you know, there's all these cross currents that affects one area impacts the other area. And this is a, you know, I hate to be simplistic about it, but this is a big challenging mess and we'll see if we can get out of it. I have some, as I mentioned, you know, I have some faith that, you know, we can get out of it with some pain not severe necessarily in terms of, you know, d- deep recessions or a depression, but there's going to be a lot of pain to go around for everyone. It's just a matter of how severe that'll be. So what kind of pain do you think people are going to experience? I believe the pain of inflation is going to get worse. And, you know, inflation impacts 100% of the people, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, some less than others because, you know, they, they have a, uh, you know, a nice dime in, in their uh, bank account and they're not worrying about such thing. But to the average folk like, like you and I, 
most of your audience, uh, it's it's going to hurt. It's prices are not going to come down rapidly in the near future for goods and services. Now, um, gasoline prices, I don't know. Uh, this is some of this relates to OPEC, and, and which is you know a, a big question mark. I know President Biden is going to visit Saudi Arabia next week or in the near term to see if he can do some work as magic if he has magic. Uh, with with uh, the Saudis to try to increase oil and maybe put some downward pressure on on the on the um, uh, gas price, but you know even if you can fill your tank more cheaply, you need to you need to have something you need to have the demand for goods so that you're right you're maybe uh, for your audience you're filling your truck with goods to to uh, take to those that want to buy those goods right and if the economy's soft on demand, um, you know, unfortunately there's less demand for goods and less of a need to uh, uh, transport those goods as well. Sure. So there's a whole set of issues out there um, that are really important and really, really risky. But uh, again, I have some faith that this is going to work out in a you know reasonable manner but like i said there's gonna be enough pain to go around for all of us oh yeah it's kind of like somebody got in the kitchen a bunch of people that weren't getting along and they added too many spices and now it's like how do you (laughs) find something that's a palatable solution you know everyone can swallow (laughs) it it is that's a that's a that's a super analogy and (laughs) the issue you know and uh maybe some somewhat like uh, my family anyway when something goes wrong in the kitchen there's a lot of finger pointing and (laughs) and this is what you know this set of policy makers those two groups that i mentioned about earlier certainly are doing a, a fair job fair amount of you know pointing the finger elsewhere away from them and yep. uh, you know the time we first of all i think it's bad sports to do that but the, you know frankly the time we spend doing that is less time we're spending solving the solving the damn problem right amen to that yeah. um we have to go to break here rick um i, I want to ask some more questions here because you're just a wealth of knowledge we're talking with rick roberts he spent 20 years at the federal reserve he's currently a professor at monmouth university you're listening to the truckers network radio show on tnc radio live stay tuned for more coming up space in a semi-truck is limited a majority of truck drivers spend a good portion of their careers living on the road trying to fit all the necessary home items personal products work documents and food in a tiny truck cab could be a challenge staying organized on the road helps you stay more productive and comfortable it also helps to be organized in the event of a dot inspection the truckers network has five helpful organization tips for truck drivers Storage containers. Storage containers are inexpensive and come in a variety of different sizes. Depending on the size, you can fit a storage container in many different places. Make sure to measure the container before buying to ensure you maximize your space. You'll want to use every bit of your cab. Some items you can put in the containers include canned or dry food, water, cleaning supplies, exercise equipment, and toiletries. Some of our recommended storage containers include Iris USA, TB42 12-quart stack and pull box, Itemy 6-pack plastic storage baskets, weight trim foldable shoe box, Command Hooks. Command Hooks are a great way to maximize your space and keep things off the floor. Install a couple Command Hooks and you can hang your everyday coat, hat, or bag. Here's a pro tip. Use Velcro to attach to containers or different items so they don't slide around while driving on bumpy roads. Some of our recommended command hooks include command small wire hooks, 16 hooks, 24 strips, photo snow adhesive hooks, ultra strong wall hangers and hooks, budding joy adhesive heavy duty hooks, over the door shoe organizer. An over the door shoe organizer is great for keeping your closet and your truck cab organized. Instead of storing shoes, store your cleaning supplies, personal items and some clothes. Check out our recommended shoe organizers. 24 Pockets, Simple Housewear Crystal Clear Over-the-Door Hanging Shoe Organizer. Aristocrat Homewares Over-the-Door Shoe Rack and Closet Organizer System with 24 extra-large heavy-duty pockets. Shower Caddies. Truck stop showers are a place you'll often be. Having a shower caddy full of your shower routine necessities will help ensure you have everything you need. 
Forgetting your toiletries will have you buying some at the truck stop or running back out to your truck. Shower caddies are also great for holding condiments, drinks, and dinnerware. Some of our recommended shower caddies include Greenbrier Small Utility Shower Caddy Tote, Seven Pocket Shower Caddy Tote. Labels. Because there's limited space in a semi-cab, most of your things will be in containers. Investing in a label maker is a great way to organize your storage containers and drawers. It also makes it easy to find what you need. Check out some of our recommended labels and label makers. They include Dymo Letratag 100H Plus Handheld Label Maker, Address Labels 2.625 by 1 Pack of 3,000 Labels. Ready for the power of positive and something that will put you back to a time you wanted to last forever? Music is the ultimate time machine. What was your favorite time? Do you want to go back there? LTD Radio features the songs of the 70s, 80s, and 90s that will transport you to a happier time. It'll make you smile and brighten your day. We could all use that about now. TNCRadio.live is proud to carry the great music of LTD Radio. Welcome back to the Truckers Network Radio Show on TNC Radio Live. I'm Shelley Johnson with Tom Kelly, and we're talking with Rick Roberts. He spent 20 years at the Federal Reserve. He's currently a professor at Monmouth University, and he's a tremendous expert on the economy. Tom, you said you had a question for Rick. Sorry, I pushed the wrong buttons there. Yeah, I do. Um, so, Rick, the uh, the president called uh, a few minutes ago. As a matter of fact, he, he, he's been listening to the show. He wanted to say this about the previous segment. It was really a productive segment, wasn't it? Um, and so we, he, he wanted to mention that. But he also said that he's going to put you in charge now because you got the lessons learned from back in 2008. What aren't we doing that we should have learned from 2008? If, you're, if, if president comes and makes you in charge of fixing this right now, what would you do first? You know, we are in uncharted waters. There is not a situation to look back to to say this is similar to that. We should do what we did back then. This is this is uh, what makes this challenge that's in front of us now, us being the country, you, I, or your listeners, you know, the, the policymakers, the challenge is that we don't have a similar situation. You always feel better about solving a problem, right? If you went through something kind of like that before, you right, know, right. you know, maybe you fixed it before, you'll do exactly that, or you kind of fixed it or you messed up, but at least you have some perspective as to what works, what doesn't work, right? In this case, we don't have a good example to look back at. 08 was a crisis, it was a much different, much different crisis, however. Um, we, we had, you know, if we break it out into those three groups, we had Congress spent a little bit of money um, in 08, nowhere's near the dollar figure they spent here. And the Fed um, held interest rates down um, and kept them down for a while. And we came out of the recession pretty quickly. Um, But in this case, we're in uncharted waters. Um, The Congress has spent excessively a lot of money, possibly well-intended. Don't get me wrong. You know, they, they want it to be safe than sorry. But more, boy, they should be sorry now. Same with the Federal Reserve. They held interest rates low for a long time and pumped a lot of money into the economy, as Shelley pointed to earlier. Um, And probably, you know, certainly with good intentions, but they did too much. And we are in uncharted waters. And then we have those supply issues that I talked about that popped in. Those three prong, that three prong monster is new. And it has us in uncharted waters i tell you we are so far out into the waters that um, and we're attempting to turn the ship back we can't even see the shore from what from which we left and the compass isn't working and the compass <laughs> isn't working and some may question uh you may have hinted at this earlier as to whether or not there's uh you know some imbibing going on <laughs> on the uh 
on the ship uh-huh. uh, in terms of are they are they seeing everything straight when they're trying to turn this around but this is really risky it's it's uh you know like i said new times uh we have so and then it's it, it, put it this in another fold another wrinkle here we're coming up on an election mm-hmm. right the midterm elections so whenever there's an election in place you have this special force out there that encourages folks nudges people to do something that is good for them to get reelected, but possibly not good for the country. So we have, we have those set of issues out there now too. So this is a whole big ball of wax. That's very, very tricky and very, very scary. It's a Pandora's box. It is. (laughs) You know, there's so much uncertainty. People don't know if they need to prepare for a tornado or an earthquake. How do people survive the potential economic upheaval maintain their savings their investments uh, i think a lot of people are just plain scared i understand and indeed i have a thread of that having been through many crises before you know i have a piece of me that's that's scared as well you know mm-hmm. each crisis presents its own fears and concerns and uh, they're out there they're real world how do you it's a great question how do you uh get ready for it um Step one is to appreciate what's on the horizon, you know, understand. And I think uh, this is why I'm very excited to join your show. I love to speak to knowledgeable folks in layman's terms, folks that can get it. Mm-hmm. Now they, they understand that maybe a little better than they formally did, but understand what's out there and what the risks are. And what we're saying now is the risk of higher inflation being out there for an extended period in through the end of 2023, in my judgment, we'll start to see it taper off towards the end of this year a little bit, meaning not increasing so much, but it's still going to be at high levels until the Fed further in- increases interest rates. And that's a trade-off, as we talked about earlier. So I expect we're going to see a, um, a slight recession or maybe even a moderate recession. Hopefully, as I mentioned, it's not going to be a severe recession. So no inflation's out there. You know, keep that in your uh, bag of understanding in terms of planning to buy things, locking into longer term contracts, um, things of that sort. And just be prepared for the uncertain. You may, I know myself, uh, not buying that extra item that I might otherwise have bought, you know, mm-hmm. just in case, you know, you don't know, you want to, you want to want to make sure that you have that little bit of a nest egg um, to fall back on in case right. times are as bad, if not worse than what I currently, currently project. Expect the unexpected and you're never surprised. Yeah. 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 So basically, well, I've heard people advise pay down debt if you can, so that you can weather the storm a little bit better. And, and would you agree with that too? If people can. I always think it's a good idea to pay down debt. The real world is at some point, um, if real world concerns are right on your doorstep in terms of you're sure you're going to, you know, for example, God forbid, lose your job, um, you know, paying down debt becomes secondary, right? You want to hold on to that extra money that you were going to pay. Uh, just to prepare to take care of your family and other critical Mm -hmm. issues. But yeah, in general, paying down debt so you're not, you know, burdened by those excessive interest rate um, pains is is a good idea. And well, it might be an opportunity if there's a bear market, people can buy in low. Uh, That's always a good thing. Uh, Absolutely. So there, there, could, there could be some bright sides to all of this uncertainty. People just have to pay attention and hang on tight and, and make sure they have a life jacket. So you see what happened with the stock market after the 08 crisis, right? It, mm-hmm. it generally trended upward and nicely. A sharp increase from, you know, let's just say 2010 to now. There's a couple mm-hmm. dips in there. Yeah. Uh, certainly some nice dips here recently, and it's likely to continue down in my judgment for certainly for the rest of the year mm-hmm. uh, with some spikes up here and there. It's not going to be a straight line down, but uh, you saw that after the 08 crisis. Yep. And I see a lot of people on Bloomberg. In fact, I was on uh, I was an interview recently where a gentleman was saying, yeah, this is a great time to buy. Look what happened in 08. Well, I'll go back to that 
point that I made earlier, 08 is much different than today. And just because uh, we saw the market go up after 08, pretty much straight up, um, doesn't mean that's what's going to happen this time when this crisis uh, subsides. It might, but I won't go uh, willy nilly, if you will, buying stocks blindly because, hey, the Dow Jones industrial average went up so sharply after the 08 crisis. It's, it's certainly going to do that now. Can't right. say that because it's a much different crisis. If they were similar, I could speak more confidently that we'd likely see something like that again. Mm-hmm. They're much different. And I have absolutely no idea what we'll see in the stock market. But, you know, at some point you're going to be quite able to pick out a, you know, a cheap, or, you know, a good price on stock or a set of stocks because they've decreased so much and it might be, it might make sense for you to buy. Um, What happens after that? I can't say. Thank you so much, Rick. We're going to the top of the hour here. We've been talking with Rick Roberts. He's a professor at Monmouth university, a wealth of information. Definitely. Thank you so much for being on the show, Rick. This has been a pleasure. Pleasure. Look forward to doing it again. Thank you for listening to another great interview on TNC Radio Live and the Truckers Network Radio Show. All of the material you hear on TNC Radio Live on our website, our broadcasts, or our podcasts are copyrighted. There can be no distribution without the express consent of TNC Radio Live and its partners. For inquiries, write us at info at TNC Radio Live. Radio Live. Radio Live. Radio Live. Radio.live. Radio.live. Radio.